Rina Kerem from the University of Illinois, who will tell us about sp spherical DAHA and quantum Q systems. So, Rina, please. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you for adapting the schedule to, uh, to this disaster. Um, so I'm sorry not to see everyone in person, but um, for those of you who got up in the morning to watch an online talk, thank you. Um, so this, this talk is only 45 minutes, so it'll just be a, a quick tour. Um, and it's mostly about one result and some methods that I learned about in the process in the last two years, which has been fun for me. So maybe it will be interesting for other people. Um, so basically the punchline is um, quantum Q systems are uh, realization of uh, spherical DAHA for various root systems. So, um, well, we had some talks, we had a talk about, by, uh, uh, well, we had talks about the Heisenberg spin chain and so on. Q systems appear in the beta ansatz solution of general, generalized Heisenberg spin chain. That's where they first appeared. Um, as, so you can view them as recursion relations for a special set of characters of, of finite dimensional modules that are now called kirla vershetikin modules, KR modules. Um, let's see, do I have a highlighting tool? Yes, KR modules. So <clears throat> they can be viewed as finite represent, dimensional representations of some infinite dimensional algebra. For example, the Yangian originally, or quantum affine algebras or current algebras, that's in the formulation of Chari and Mora. So for each algebra, all you have to know is that a KR module is parameterized by two um, numbers. One of them is the fundamental, which fundamental weight, and the other one is a multiple of it. So it's parameterized by a highest weight, which is a multiple of a fundamental weight. And so for SLN, these are just sure functions and it, uh, for rectangular representations they satisfy this recursion relation. So it's a bilinear relation. And the recursion relation can be viewed as having boundary conditions and initial data. So the boundary conditions are that, well, it doesn't make sense to talk about the highest weight with the highest weight omega zero for a finite dimensional representation or omega n. So those characters we set equal to one. And then initial data, if you want the solution to actually be characters and the initial character data is that the trivial character is equal to one and the fundamental character is the elementary symmetric function in X. Then the solution for positive K are going to be sure functions of rectangular representations, and it's known that they satisfy this recursion relation. Why this recursion relation? Well, it shows it showed up in TBA originally. Um, so when you take the, the infinite spectral parameter limit, um, or, or you can get it from the fusion relation that was mentioned yesterday for, for um, uh, Heisenberg spin chain. Um, but the full list of Q systems was written down by Hatayama, Kuniba, and company in the early 2000s. For any affine algebra, you can write a Q system. This is just the simplest one. So I'm not going to list too many of them. I'll, I'll mention what they look like in a moment. But uh, let, me, let me say the following. They're intimately related to fermionic character formulas for multiplicities in the tensor product of finite dimensional representations. So that is, if every finite dimension, so if you take a Heisenberg spin chain, generalized so that its Hilbert space is the tensor product of finite dimensional representations, all of which should be of KR type, so they should have a rectangular highest weight. And then you look at the decomposition into finite dimensional irreducibles of chi, for example, then these multiplicities, the dimension m here is the dimension of the multiplicity space. These multiplicities have some combinatorial formula, which is explicit, which um, is now proven. And the way you prove it is you keep the Q system. It's known to be intimately related to this. And I will not go into that proof, but, um, what I want to say is that this, so here I regard this as a multiplicity. So this is what the Hamiltonian is acting on. The Hamiltonian generally commute, uh, commutes with a finite dimensional algebra. And so if you linearize the spectrum, you can endow this multiplicity space with a grading. It was known by Kirillov and Rishitikin in the 80s and, and then generalized by Hatayam et al. Or you can define a grading on the space. So yesterday, uh, Anne Schilling mentioned crystal bases. Can, the energy function crystal bases will again give you uh, a grading on this multiplicity space. 
or in 1999 flagging and log def also defined a grading on this space by considering these finite dimensional modules instead of Yangian modules or quantum affine algebra modules as just current algebra modules. And they define the grading. And the grading essentially uh, is the alpha naught grading that Anne Schilling mentioned yesterday. So what I'm going to consider is this function, which I called a, grading a graded character. And so if you don't know how I got here, that's fine. I'm to simply consider this function, which is uh, the Q just measures the grading, right? Uh, so the graded space, the nth graded component of the grading, graded space gave the factor Q to the N. I take its dimension and multiply by the character of this irreducible module, which in this case is a short function. And so this is some sort of symmetric function with coefficients, which are uh, non-negative integers, polynomials in Q. And in general, it's a vial symmetric function. In the case of AN, it's just a symmetric function. But I put a plus or minus one here because I want to consider other types. And so the vial uh, group can extend to uh, <clears throat> taking inverses of the, of the variable. And so um, a few years ago uh, with Philippe Di Francesco, we discovered that in fact, there is a, there is a formula for this function in terms of rating operators, at, at least in type A. So if you take the function one, which is in here, and act on it with some Q difference operators, um, which are solutions. So this is the punchline. There are solutions of the Q system, but it's in a quantized form. So it's an equation for non-commuting variables, which sort of Q commute, which I'll define in a moment. Then you can write these graded characters as a product of raising operators acting on one. These, ra these raising operators have a, a, a form of Q difference operators. And so this is our main result for, for all the classical root systems. The quant how do you get a quantum Q system? You take the Q system, you consider it to be a cluster algebra, and as such, it in this case has a canonical quantization. The Q system itself is an integrable uh, discrete evolution. I'll explain why in a moment. And so the quantization is also uh, a, a, an integrable uh, non-commutative quantum discrete evolution for some non-commuting variables, which are these uh, raising operators. And the conserved quantities of this discrete evolution, they turn out to be uh, quantum toda Hamiltonians, relativistic quantum toda Hamiltonian. And all of this implies that the, these graded characters satisfy certain difference equations. So toda type equations. So therefore we can uh, conclude that these characters are always some form of generalized Q Whitaker functions functions or the eigenfunctions of the quantum total Hamiltonians. Okay, so that's the main result. And what do I mean when I say classical root systems? So that's the, the, my point for today is how do I make this statement in, in generality, at least for the classical root systems? So here I list the, the diagrams for the affine algebras. And so this is just for the notation. So affine algebras, so this is uh, SLN hat and B, C, and D. And then there are the twisted types. So there's the twist uh, automorphism. I forgot who talked about that two days ago, but there's a twist automorphism. And so these are the twisted types. And all of these are considered to be the classical affine root systems because there are infinite se sequences of them. So they don't include the exceptional types. And then I want to say that this is the Katz's notation. You can find it in this book. But if you, um, if you dig very carefully, uh, you can find that McDonald also knew about these. Um, so there, you can try and match up to the McDonald notation. And McDonald sees two finite root systems, R and R star. And so each one of these classical root systems is parameterized by two finite root systems, which are almost always the same system, A, A, D, D, and so on, except for the cases B and C, which I called non-simply laced in which case they're duals to each other. R is the Langlands dual of R star. So these two notations, Q systems for these classical quote root systems, they all have this form. It's uh, So let me explain what I mean by classical discrete evolution. There are two variables. A stands for a node in the Dinkic diagram and K 
stands for the multiple of the fundamental weight in type A. And so I just simply write this down. Um, Q at K plus one depends on Q at K in the neighboring affine, uh, in the na neighboring nodes in the dinking diagram and Q at K minus one. And so I consider this to be a two-step recursion relation for these variables Q. Once you give me two initial, two sets of initial data, it has a unique solution. The Cartan matrix here is the Cartan matrix of the root system R in this table. So it's a finite Cartan matrix. And then what, the only thing that indicates to me which dinking diagram I'm talking about is this second term here. And the second term depends on the Cartan matrix and which what is R. And so there are some exceptions, but most of the time it looks like type A, except for, for the, ed, the terms at the end, near the node end, near the nth node. So it's essentially a boundary term. That's how I want to consider it. So all Q systems look like this. And I say that they're mostly cluster algebra mutations, and this is not a talk about cluster algebras, so I won't say which cluster algebras, and I, but I do say mostly the troublesome one is always a two, twisted A2N for those of you who, who worry about such things. So that is, in fact, not a cluster algebra mutation. But nevertheless, I'm going to include it in the same list because of the relation to Kornwinder theory. So the goal is, okay, each one of these Q system I claim is an integrable discrete evolution. It means that it has uh, rank G, uh, conserved quantities, which can be written as Laurent polynomials in some initial data. And I want to find these conserved quantities, at least prove that it's integrable. And each one of these has a quantization. And once it has a quantization, I claim that there's a functional representation of this algebra in which the elements Q, which are non-commuting, will then be become Q difference operators. And the unifying framework is uh, Kornwinder McDonald theory. That's that's my punchline. So how do I quantize a Q system? So I, I start out with a Q system and they all look like this. Remember, there's a monomial here, M A K, that depends on the dinking diagram. So I, I start, I make these um, Qs non-commuting variables. There are clusters. Within a cluster, they form a Q vial algebra. We had uh, I think Kuniba mentioned the Q vial algebra. So they Q commute with each other within the same cluster. And I don't have to define for you what the same what the same cluster is. Essentially, when they're neighbors, they Q commute according to essentially the inverse Cartan matrix. So if omega are the, are the fundamental root uh, weights of the root system R, and omega star are the fundamental weights of the root system R star, remember R is almost always equal to R star, then the matrix lambda AB that controls the commutation relations between them is just omega star dot omega. So it's the inverse Cartan matrix essentially. And then there is a subtlety if you have a non simply laced uh, system in types B and C, then there's these little uh, TAs, which are two for short roots and one otherwise. So that comes here. But essentially, this is just a Q vial algebra. That's the Q commutations. And then the other thing I need to specify are the non-commutative evolutions that generalize this. So the non-commutative evolutions look exactly like the classical ones, except that there's a little factor due to the inverse, the diagonal term in the inverse Cartan matrix. I should say this is almost always lambda A, A is almost always A. Most of the time, this is very simple, except for <clears throat> the boundary terms. And then on the right-hand side here, I have to be a little bit careful in the non-simply uh, laced cases. Q at equal time, they don't commute. So I have to normal order things here. Well, vial order. This is this is the vial ordered product. So it's, just, it's a normal ordering. But you notice that this has exactly the same form as this. This is you know, always the case with quantum cluster algebra. So here, in the example of uh, type A, um, the Qs, uh, nearest neighbor Qs just commute with a matrix min AB, which is essentially the inverse Cartan matrix, well, with some uh, ingredients extra. And then uh, at equal time, Qs commute. So the only thing that's different about the uh, mutation or, or evolution equation is that there's a Q to the A here. So I, I was very careful in the order that I wrote things down 
If you write them down in this order, that's the quantum Q system. So the program is the following, and so this is my, my outline finally. For each affine root system, I want to prove that the quantum Q system is integrable, find the conserved quantities, and find the <clears throat> functional representation of the solution, so as Q difference operators. And what I want you to retain from my talk is the method, actually. And the method for type AN minus one, which classic, so we did this by hand for type AN minus one, but if you want to generalize this to all the root systems, then the ingredients are bispectrality or duality in, in uh, McDonald Cohenwinder theory. And then this notion of um, Fourier transform in the, in the language of Cherednik or uh, uh, Q Whitaker transform. And, and in fact, I don't deal with the full McDonald theory, I take its Q Whitaker limit. And then there is an um, SL2, so the modular group acts on the DAHA, the double affine Hecke algebra. And one of the two generators is tau plus, descends to an action on the Q Whitaker limit. It commutes with the total Hamiltonians. It can be, uh, it can be expressed, it, it can be interpreted as time translation. K goes to K plus one. And okay, there's a relation with the Baxter operator. It commutes with the Baxter operator. And I want to exactly compute how it looks like. Okay, so that's my program. So let me remind you about I want something to maybe. Ask you something. Yeah. When you say it should, you prove the integrability. Could you just give a definition of what, which, uh, what is integrability in this case? Just to have um, rank G commuting Hamiltonians that commute with a time translation. See. So, so the rank of G is how many commuting Hamiltonians I need, and I want to, I want to find those Hamiltonians. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> My next talk will be about Lex matrices. Okay, so reminder the McDonald, the first McDonald equation is an eigenvalue equation. You take the McDonald operator D1 acting on some function P lambda of X, where lambda is a parameter, gives you an eigenvalue, the first elementary symmetric function of S, where S is a multivariable that encodes this lambda in the following way, x is q to the lambda times t to the rho, where rho is the half sum of positive rho. So it's just a, a parameterization. And uh, I write these McDonald operators in terms of x and the q difference operator in x, which I call gamma. So gamma i xj is delta ij xj gamma i. So these are q difference operators. And the solution to this, uh, a McDonald polynomials if you require that they be monic and polynomial. And if you require that lambda is an integer partition. Everybody knows this. But let me just change points of view. The universal function, you take this polynomial, this McDonald polynomial, and instead of considering lambda to be a parameter, you, you elevate it to the level of a, a formal variable. So you just write P, instead of P lambda of X, you write P of X and S. Remember S parameterizes lambda. And now lambda is just formal. It's not an integer partition, it's just a variable. And then you write down the McDonald eigenvalue equation. It's the same equation. But then the, you notice that the McDonald operator can be expanded in powers in some cone of the variables X. And so if you choose a cone, this equation has a unique series solution of the following form. It's a series in X to the minus uh, alpha I or alpha I are the simple roots of type A. So this is the sum over the positive root lattice. The coefficients are functions of S depending on each root. But then there's a term in front that is absolutely essential, Q to the mu dot lambda, which is symmetric in mu and lambda where mu is the parameterization of X in the same way that lambda is the parameterization of S. So these solutions are unique, just expand as a power series. And uh, they were computed explicitly by Shirishi and Naomi. And I believe also Stockman has these 
uh, as basic Harish Chandra series. Um, okay, so then what do you do with this universal solution? Why is it called a universal solution? Um, well, it looks like this. And if you choose a normalization C beta, such that C of zero is one and fix lambda to be an integer partition, then it turns out that the series truncates. Most of the coefficients are equal to zero and it becomes a symmetric polynomial in X. And those are the McDonald polynomials. Any McDonald polynomials, polynomial can be obtained as a specialization of this series, of this universal solution. And that's why it's called a universal solution. But this is not the only important normalization. So I'm going to call this function delta of S in the future. So just so that you know, not quite McDonald's delta of S, but if you choose C0 instead of being one, if you choose it to be this product over, well, it's, it's essentially the affine, part of the affine root. root. Um, then the solutions are self-dual in the sense that, well, or by, uh, this is the, called sometimes the bispectral property. If you exchange X and S, solution is invariant. It's, it has this symmetry. So this is the symmetry of the double affine Hecke algebra. Uh, it's McDonald's duality if you choose both mu and lambda to be integer partitions. So he knew about this, but it's true for the universal function as well. So it's true more generally. And then this implies the Pieri rules. From duality to Pieri rules, you start with the eigenvalue equation with a self-dual normalization, P2. Uh, you rename the variables X and S. I haven't done anything. And then you use the duality and you come up with Here's a Q difference operator in S acting on P is EA of X now instead of S, right? Acting on P. And I claim that this is the Pieri rule. Okay, if you specialize the integer partitions and you, you do some uh, renormalization in terms of deltas, delta is, this, remember, this infinite product. This is delta. This is the Pieri operator, which I want to call Hamiltonians. So what happened, Pieri operator, what happens to the McDonald polynomial when you multiply it by an elementary symmetric function? And this equation also has a unique solution as a series in S to the minus alpha I and the two uh, series solutions should be equal. There's two ways of expressing the universal function. So Irina, just another quick question. Uh, so by Pieri, you mean multiplication by ordinary, uh, complete or... Uh... Elementary symmetric functions. Yeah, not McDonald elementary. So, so no. not elementary the, symmetric. Act, the usual ones. Okay. Okay. So the Q Whitaker limit here's the space of McDonald polynomials, which has this uh, symmetry. Q T goes to Q inverse T inverse. Um, these are the Hall Littlewood functions, and these are the Q Whitaker functions. And it just depends if you want Q Whitaker and Q or Q Whitaker and Q inverse. So I'm considering this limit. So the limit T going to infinity. So this delta of S. When t goes to infinity, it becomes, it becomes kind of simple. You just take the dominant term here. It just goes to one. And because remember that this variable s depends on t. But delta as a function of x, it doesn't go to one. It goes to delta bar, which is, again, an infinite product. OK, so I lose the symmetry. I lose in, in the duality property. I lose the symmetry when I take the q vertical limit. This duality starts to look like this. Here, pi sort of is, I consider this to be a type one Whitaker function and kappa, I consider it to be a fundamental Whitaker function. And they're related by this infinite product in between. Here I use the capital lambda to denote Q to the lambda I where lambda I is, remember the, the highest, the weight. And so the eigenvalue equation in the Q Whitaker limit becomes simpler because E of S, remember S depends on T, and so you only take the dominant term, E of S becomes a monomial lambda to the omega A, where omega A is the fundamental weight. So the eigenvalue equation becomes simpler on the right-hand side, but nothing happens much to the McDonald operator. It looks exactly the same apart from one term. It's still a rational function. And again, you can find a series solution, which will truncate when C0 is equal to one, 
at integer partition to a polynomial, which is called a class one Whitaker polynomial. What happens to the Pieri rule? Okay, nothing happens to the right hand side. You still have an elementary symmetric function on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, what happens to my Pieri operators is they become they become Laurent polynomials. So they're much much simpler. They're no longer rational functions, and these are in fact um, the Toda Hamiltonians. So quantum relativistic Toda Hamiltonians. You can find them, and for example, in type A, you can find them in the tingles. And this solution to the Pieri rule is called a fundamental Q Whitaker function. You can find expressions for this infinite series as well. Okay, now I want to talk about the modular group. So SL2Z acts on the spherical Daha. So we're always talking about spherical Daha because we're talking about symmetric polynomials. And the element tau plus, which is one of the two generators of SL2Z, it's known, so Cherenik, for example, wrote down its, act, its action on the fun, uh, functional representation. It acts by the adjoint action of this Gaussian, which is not in the Daha, but it's in the completion of the Daha. It's very simple. The action is very simple. On X, is, it just commutes. This is just a function of X, so it commutes with X. And on gamma I, it just multiplies gamma I by X I. So the action of this uh, the Gaussian is very simple, so it has a very simple action on McDonald operators. And so I'm going to define DAK to be the case trans tau plus translate of the Q Whitaker limit of the McDonald operator. So here's the theorem. These DAKs actually are the solutions of the quantum Q system in type A. So we prove this uh, using combinatorial means, which was rather painful uh, in 2019 with Philippe Di Francesco. <coughs> So together with the elementary uh, symmetric functions, these uh, solutions satisfy the spherical Daha. I, what we did in 2019 was really painful. We did It's not generalizable to the classical root systems that I showed before. So I want to show this other proof. And this other proof uses these ingredients of duality and Fourier transform. What does it mean by Fourier transform? If you have a complete set of eigenfunctions of some set of operators fi, and so fi be a Q difference operator in X acting on pi is some Q difference operator in lambda acting on pi. Then uh, if these generators satisfy some relations, these generators will satisfy, you can conclude that these generators will satisfy the same relations with the opposite multiplication. That's what I call a Fourier transform. So here's the method. Define these D hats, which are on the right hand side of this equation. They're Q difference operators in lambda. They're solutions of the opposite Q system with the following initial data. DA0 is just the McDonald operator, uh, the tra Fourier transform of the McDonald operator at Q, uh, in the Q Whitaker limit is just lambda to the omega A. That's the eigenvalue in the Q Whitaker limit. So we already know that that agrees. Uh, DA1 hat is another monomial. It's just lambda to the omega A, T to the omega A. And so they satisfy a Q commutation with DA0, which agrees with the opposite quantum Q system. That's why they're chosen this way. And then because we have a two-step recursion relation, the, the Q system is a two-step recursion relation, we can define uniquely all the DAK hats from this opposite Q system. So we know that this eigenvalue equation holds. And what we want to prove is that DAK of X defined uh, as the trans as the uh, tau plus translate of the McDonald operator is the Fourier transform of these d hats defined from the quantum Q system, and that proves that the DAK these Q difference operators in X satisfy the quantum Q system. So um, for this, we have to compute the Fourier transform of Cherenik's Gaussian, but it's uniquely determined by requiring that these. So what I want uh, d hat, if I act on it with g, the inverse, the adjoint action of g, to be d a at k plus one. But d a, d hat is defined uniquely from the quantum Q system. And so this just gives me a recursive way of, the, of computing g of lambda. And the theorem is that g of lambda actually exists and is unique up to scalar multiple because it only acts by the adjoint action. And it's a Q difference operator in lambda that looks like a product of quantum dilogarithms for a good reason. And so this product, maybe everybody can understand. It's just an infinite product 
in lambda. And what happens in the exponential here, TA is the Q difference operator like gamma, except it's the Q difference operator in lambda. So it Q commutes with lambda. So again, TA and lambda A, they generate the Q via lambda. So this is some sort of complicated Q difference operator in lambda, but it commutes with all the quantum total Hamiltonians. You can prove this by explicit calculation simply by listing the quantum qu total Hamiltonians. And then you have to prove that it is indeed the Fourier transform of the Gaussian. And you do this again by calculation by using the series expansion for the universal function. So um, because of lack of time, maybe I'll just tell you how you do this. You use the Pieri rules and you use the fact that the Pieri rules have a unique solution, a unique series solution. And because G commutes with H, I can move G over here and then act on K. And of course, G is the Q difference operator in lambda. It doesn't see X, X, so it commutes with E A of X. So I have that H1 acting on this function G K is, has the same eigen value acting on G A K. So therefore G times K is an eigen function. It must be proportional to the Q Whitaker function. And I, all I have to do is compute the proportionality constant. And then I use the explicit uh, uh, form of the series solution to compute this proportionality constant. Proportionality constant can be a function of x. And in fact, it's the Chernik Gaussian. This is just a calculation. And so the corollary is that the Fourier transform of these d hats is indeed uh, dA of x. D A K of X. So it's the translated McDonald Q difference operator in the Q Whitaker limit. Satisfies the quantum Q system, and the Hamiltonians are indeed the conserved quantities. Okay. And so in the remaining five minutes, this is the remark about Baxter Q operator. There is a Baxter Q operator, um, which one can compute, in fact, from the action on the quantum cluster algebra. So this is, um, you can find it in uh, Schrader and Shapiro, for example. Baxter Q operator has um, U, a spectral parameter, and if you evaluate the spectral parameter to be one, you will in fact find uh, this time translation operator if you know enough about how to work with quantum dye logarithms. So what is the generalization to BC type root systems? So I think um, this was mentioned uh, in, in a talk by, by um, Lauren Williams, a while ago, so that you have Kerwinder operators depend on parameters A, B, C, D. Their eigenfunctions are the Kerwinder Kerwinder eigenfunctions, and instead of being symmetric, they're BC type symmetric. So the Val group uh, acts by exchange of variables and also by inversions. For A, B, C, D, it specializes them to certain powers of t and q. They're actually associated with one of the classical affine root systems that I listed at the beginning of my talk. And these are specialization. I just want you to notice that the specializations are always monomials in T and Q. And the reason that it's important that, it's, that you have T appearing here is I want to make the statement, you can't take the Q Whitaker limit until you do this specialization because T appears in this specialization. The Kornwinder operators are slightly more complicated than the McDonald operators. But again, I want you to notice that they can be expanded as power series in x to the minus alpha i, where alpha i are the fundamental roots of um, b type, in fact. An eigenvalue equation. Now, here, the elementary symmetric function is the elementary symmetric function in s and s inverse instead of just in s. It has a unique solution in series form. Again, I just write down the universal function again as I did in the McDonald case. So I have coefficients, which are functions of this S, and then it's a power series in lambda over the uh, roots, the positive roots of type Pn. So again, there are two normalizations, the same in, as for McDonald. If I choose the leading coefficient to be one, then these specialize at integer partitions to be symmetric, vital symmetric polynomials called Kornwinder polynomials and dual friendly solutions instead of self dual solutions. Because um, so C0 should be this function delta, which I call of alpha star alpha for me is A, B, C, D. It's this particular product over all of the affine roots. 
A star, B star, and so on are related to A, B, C, D. It's a duality transformation on the parameters of the spherical daha. And then duality or bispectrality for Corwinder uh, functions look like, looks like this. P of X and X is equal to P star of S and X. And I remind you that almost all of the time, star is the same as non-star. The only time that these are not self-dual are in BC types. Okay, so um, again, starting from the eigenvalue equation using duality, I obtain the Pieri rules in exactly the same way as before, only I want you to notice that here in the Pieri rules, this is the elementary symmetric function in X and X inverse. And also this is D of alpha star instead of D of alpha, because in the duality I had alpha goes to alpha star. So the Hamiltonians belong to the dual uh, cone winder operators. If you specialize now alpha to B, so you specialize A, B, C, D to correspond to the affine root systems, then take the Q-Whitaker limit, T goes to infinity. This operator here will give you a bunch of commuting total Hamiltonians. So it's, it, this is what you have to do in order to get these commuting total Hamiltonians. Here, I'll show you the Hamiltonians. The Hamiltonians look like this, okay? Um, I don't know if you can see because it's a little bit small, but they look exactly like the A-type total Hamiltonians, except now they're, they have Ti, which are Q difference operators in lambda, and Ti inverse, which are, uh, they don't appear in type A. And also there's a bound, there's always a boundary term. That's how they're different from type. So one should think about Sklian and transfer matrices in this case. Okay, but uh, too much for this talk. Um, what I want to say is that the Pieri rules then look exactly the same and the eigenvalue equations they have a lambda to the omega i star. It's a monomial on the right-hand side, which is why it's so much easier to deal with. And then we repeat the process. We compute trend, time translation operators, which are the um, uh, Whitaker transform, transform of the Cherednik Gaussian in exactly the same way. We define d zero hat to be this eigenvalue lambda to the omega star and then D1 hat to be this monomial, same as in type A, except that I have an omega star here instead of omega, and then define uniquely um, the time translated D hat like this. Okay, I, I'm skipping over a lot of difficulty here, which has to do with long and short roots. So what I'm saying here only holds for the long labels. If you have short roots, then you're in trouble. You have to work much harder. You choose this to be the solution of the um, opposite uh, quantum Q system, and this defines for you how G should act uniquely. There is a unique solution to this equation, and G of lambda is then the time translation operator. And since I computed for you the Hamiltonians before, you can show by hand it actually commutes with all the Hamiltonians. So the theorem is that these functions are unique up to scalar multiple. They commute with the quantum total Hamiltonians, and therefore the and, and that the Fourier transforms satisfy the quantum Q systems. So specialized Kornwinder operators satisfy the quantum Q systems. And also these functions G, in some at least in some cases, we can prove that there are evaluations of generalizations of the Baxter operator acting on the appropriate cluster algebra. Okay, so I have to stop here. So my summary is that uh, quantum Q systems essentially correspond to the spherical daha and the Q-Whitaker limit. The raising operators QAK are, um, they generate um, generalized Q-Whitaker functions or graded characters. The quantum Q systems are integrable and they have to do with the, uh, uh, quantum relativistic total Hamiltonians with some boundary terms. And um, the evaluation of the Baxter Q operator gives you the tank translation or den twist. Um, and then there's some upcoming work about the cluster algebra structure of the full spherical daha. The homework is you have to repeat all of these for ex exceptional types. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here. Okay, so thank you very much for your talk. Uh, are there any questions in the audience or online? Uh, hello, Renard. Uh, 
I just wanted to ask about sort of interpretation of things a bit. So you start off with this key system that you view as a classical integrable system, and then you quantize it and show all this nice structure. But for the original Q system, there's an existing connection with quantum integrable systems. So do those connections survive this other quantization? Uh, <laughs> okay, so this Q that I used to quantize has nothing to do with UQ of whatever quantum group you're talking about. It has to do with the grading. And the, and the relation is, is I should have made a, bit, a, a slightly more bigger deal out of it. What I was uh, looking at was linear spec linearized spectrum that you get from the beta ansatz solution to these generalized Heisenberg spin chains. And if you compute the partition function according to this uh, beta ansatz solution with a linearized spectrum, then what you get are precisely these uh, generalized Q-Whitaker functions. Um, so I'm sorry about the There are many, many Qs in, the, in this. Okay, so, but the Q of the grading doesn't have to do with the Q of the quantum group, just with the with a um, linearized spectrum of the beta ansatz. But the quantization with respect to this other Q that's not the Q of the quantum group in the quantum integrable system connection does that does does that have an interpretation? That's um, it's slow. I don't know the direct interpretation. In fact, I have to say for now I don't know. John, for a quick question. Uh, yes. Uh... It's sort of a similar question to Robert's, but in a different sense. If I remember correctly, uh, when you're dealing with the transfer matrices and you mentioned Sklenner and so on, uh, you've got uh, also some uh, some of, uh, I mean, you, ha you have these T relations. And in some ways, one can look at the Q relations as a classical limit of the T relations. That's correct. That's correct. So is there any, uh, that's another notion. It's not the, it's not the Q variable, but is there well, any I, I think it's... that? Yeah, no, I mean, so I, I think there must be some sort of um, hidden symmetry that I'm not aware of. So here's what I do know. Um, these Hamiltonians that I wrote down, almost uh, oh, no, sorry, half of them approximately, come from um, the refactorization of R matrices. So, but not the quantization. So it, the classical limit of these Hamiltonians, if you take the R matrix, so there's a work by... Uh, uh, Kellen, calendar, whatever, uh, Rashitikin, uh, and then uh, others, um, showing that there's integrability in the, so classical integrability coming from the R matrices, and that gives you these classical Hamiltonians. So this quantization is beyond that, and I don't know how to interpret it in terms of those R matrices. It must be an interpretation. That's, uh, thank you very much, and thank you again for your talk. Thank you for your attention.